Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. This week, Jonathan Bennett joins me. We're going to be talking about Ruby Spy, a way to find out where your Ruby program is slowing down. You're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Jonathan Bennett. Episode 487, recorded June 6th, 2018, Ruby Spy. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Home plays a big role in your life. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully, so you can be confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. Get started at rocketmortgage.com slash floss. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free, Libre, open source software. I am your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at Stonehenge.com, bringing you each week the movers, the shakers, the big projects, little projects, projects you may be using every day, totally unaware of it, projects you might want to download and play with right after the show. I think today will be one of those. Joining me once again is my lovely and talented co-host, Jonathan Bennett. Jonathan, welcome back. Thank you, Randall. It's good to be here once again. Yes, yes. And it looks like you're speaking to us from roughly the same place you always speak to us from. Yes, I you know I don't get out much. I'm one of these geeks that just always stays in the office. <laughs> I'm here in Lawton, Oklahoma, the flyover state, the corporate headquarters here, the home office. Nice, nice. And I am again, as I was last week, in my uh, Beaverton apartment, Beaverton house. Actually, it's not an apartment, uh, but my one room in this house is mine, and the rest is all to my my buddies and and their spouses and mother in laws and stuff like that. So and the dogs. You might hear the dogs occasionally on the show again as it happens occasionally, because dogs get all wound up about anybody that comes to the front door. Well, enough about that. Let's talk about what we're going to talk about today. Today we have a uh, a project called Ruby Spy or RB Spy. We don't quite know how it's pronounced yet, but uh, Julie Evans created this. Julia uh, Julia Evans. Sorry, let's get all the letters in that belong to the name. Uh, created this to do uh, profiling of Ruby. Now, Ruby's a language that's been around for, man, it must be like 20 years now. It's, it's, not, it's uh, younger than Perl, uh, because I think most of uh, Perl inspired a lot of Ruby. I think Ruby also was inspired by Smalltalk. So uh, when Ruby first came out, I f- first started looking at this because I went, oh, here's my two favorite languages, Smalltalk and Perl. And this looks like sort of the, uh, the, the what, what they would do if they had to crossbreed them. Um, but I never really got into Ruby. I know we've talked to... Uh, the guy who created Ruby on Rails here about eight or nine years ago on the show, um, and then, uh, uh, but uh, so 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 what what Julie has done is created what's called a, a profiler, and what that does is it lets you know where your code is spending the most time, because one of the first rules about optimization is don't, so you wait until it's too slow, uh, you know of course. You don't do stupid things in the code, like loop infinitely over a bunch of items or something like that. But but you, you, what you need to do is actually get in and instrument it and figure out where it's spending all of its time. And then you can concentrate your effort on uh, speeding that parts of it up. So, yeah, um, just um, that's, that's, that's what I know about profiling. And this is a... Um, uh, a lightweight profiler from the description. It's a sampling profiler, which means it can be easily applied to uh, running applications already and tell you where in your code you're spending all your time. And it looks like there are some nice displays and stuff like that. Maybe we'll throw a couple of the videos up here on the video feed if you want it. Um, anyway, cool, cool. Uh, what do you know about this, Jonathan? Uh, not a whole lot more than you just said. Uh, I think we will also use today, as if Julia is up to it, a brief intro to Ruby. Uh, as probably a lot of people have heard of Ruby and don't know a whole lot about it, um, and I am definitely in that camp as well. Uh, I've, of course, played with some profilers in the past, and so hopefully can ask some intelligent questions about that. But looking forward to learning more about this uh, kind of as an ecosystem, and Ruby as a whole. Yeah, well, I, I know Ruby's two primary uh, things is, is Ruby on Rails, like I mentioned earlier, and Puppet. So Puppet's all written in Ruby as well, so... I'm sure that uh, Julie will have something to say about that as well. So, But before we do that, we do have an important message because this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. The mortgage experience wasn't keeping up with the times. It was dated, and it needed a client-focused technological revolution. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. 
Rocket Mortgage gives you the confidence you need when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. It's simple, allowing you to fully understand all the details and be confident you're getting the right mortgage for you. It's convenient. Their trusted partners allow you to share your financial information with Rocket Mortgage at the touch of a button. And it's powerful. Whether you're looking to buy your first home or your 10th, Rocket Mortgage is able to perform thousands of calculations in seconds. Based on your income, assets, and credit, Rocket Mortgage can analyze all the home loan options for which you qualify and find one that's just right for you. Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Apply simply, understand fully, mortgage confidently. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash floss. That's rocketmortgage.com slash F-L-O-S-S. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, nmlsconsumeraccess.org number 3030. We thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their sponsorship of Floss Weekly. And now let's go ahead and bring on our guest, Julia. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. And where are you um, speaking to us from? I'm in Montreal. Montreal, Canada. Do you have to do some in sort of Canada. conversion to get across the border there with Skype? Or I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It all works <laughs> together. So, um, so tell us a little bit about when I would. What problem am I having when I would reach for something like RB Spy or Ruby Spy, however you want to call it? Well, I really like the way you introduced it, right? Because you're like, well, the way that um, you don't start by optimizing your code, right? You start by just like waiting until your code gets slow and then figuring out and being like, okay, time to profile it. Um, actually, I wanted to ask you to a question, which is what profilers have you worked with before? Uh, I'm primarily in the uh, Perl realm. So there's like three or four in there, particularly the NYT prof, which is sort of the grand uh, or the, the master of all of them. And so that is... Um, that's a profiler that uh, actually does intercept all the subroutine calls. So it's not, it's not, it's very invasive in terms of performance. You don't want to run it in production because it's pretty crazy that way. I think it will also do sampling as well, but I'm not sure. And to also answer that question, I mainly do C programming, and so I GDB and some of the the tools associated with that to uh, spit out, you know, what functions program is spending all of its time in. Do you use perf with C code? Um, I believe I've used that some. Um, it it has been a while, and I've slept a few times since the last time I set all that tool chain up to do all of that profiling. Totally. Um, so actually, all of this gets at something I think that's really important about profiling, which is that it's something that most developers do pretty infrequently, right? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. one interesting interesting thing to me about profiling is that like every language has completely different profiling tools, and they all work in different ways, and they all have different command line options, and they all have different output formats, and it's like. <laughs> I think it's pretty challenging for people who aren't obsessed with performance to get started with profilers in general. Um, and so, um, the way so the how reason did, I how did, sorry, how, go ahead. how did RB, yeah how did RB Spy get started then? Right. Um, so there, like, so there there are a lot of different kinds of profilers. One axis that you can think about is like, do you need to edit your program source code to start profiling it or not? Um, so with the all of the profilers for Ruby um, basically required you to edit the program's code to profile it, mm. um, which okay. is not great, right? Like it, it's they worked pretty well once you like once you edited your pro program's code, um, but if you just had a program that was slow and you were like, hey, what is this doing? You couldn't just ask that question, right? And you couldn't just say, hey, um, what is the stack of my program right now? Um, you can do that with Java, for example. I don't know if either of you have written a lot of Java. Um, I try to avoid it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, but so 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 people people have some negative feelings about Java, but Java has an extremely good profiling ecosystem. Um, so if you have a Java program, there's this command called JStack, which you can run, and it will just tell you the current stack of your Java program, which is amazing if your Java program is stuck and you want to know what it's doing. Right? Like it's so useful. Um, and it's something that actually a lot of programming languages don't have kind of built in, like just the ability to be like, hey, what's the stack of this program right now? Um, mm -hmm. I don't even know how to do it with C. Like, or I, yeah, I mean, you can do a GDB in C. Yeah, you can do a GDB pretty easily. Um, but you need to know a little more magic. Like, you need to know how to do it with GDB. Um, but with Ruby, you couldn't, right? So if you had a Ruby program that was doing something or that was stuck, you can say like, hey, what are you doing, Ruby? It'd be like, I don't know. Right. There's no way to figure it out, um, which I found kind of offensive um, because like I'd use Java and I'd use like C profilers. Um, and so to me, I felt like I'm entitled to know what my Ruby program is doing and I should be able to know. And like, why? <laughs> why does this tool not exist? If that makes sense. 
So you're basically uh, scratching your own itch. You said there was no tool for it. And you said, well, I can spend some of my nights and weekends and whatever else time I have left um, and uh, and build this. What? How do? You, how does it attach? How does it know where it is in the application if you don't have to uh, augment the source code somehow? Yeah. Um, so the way it got started with this is, so, so we talked about GDB, right? And how you can use GDB uh, on any C program to like inspect that program's memory and to see, you can see what function is currently running. Um, you can look at any part of the memory and like figure out what's going on. Um, and so what people were doing with Ruby uh, before this profiler existed um, is if they wanted to know what the Ruby program were doing, they would actually like attach to the Ruby interpreter with GDB um, and then like poke around inside the Ruby interpreter's memory um, to figure out what to do. Um, so like there's this Ruby current thread variable in the Ruby interpreter. And so you can start there and then you can find the stack, like the Ruby stack, not the C stack of your Ruby program. And then you can figure out all of the functions that are currently running. Um, so somebody, uh, I, I was talking to somebody who works at Shopify um, and he said, hey, I have this GDB script that you, where you can use GDB to figure out what your Ruby program is currently doing. Um, and so that was kind of the starting point I used was like this like pattern of using GDB. Um, but then I thought, well, this is really hard to use, right? Like this isn't, most people are probably not going to resort to using GDB to figure out what the Ruby program is doing. Like that's probably, it's just like too much work. Um, even if we did a good job, like even if I did a good job of documenting it or like I wrote a blog post being like, hey, here's how you do this. Like it's not realistic. Um, and so I spent a lot of time figuring out how GDB does that exactly, which we can talk about if you're interested. Mm. Like, how does GDB extract information from programs? Before we get to that, can I step back and ask you a couple of, are, are you up to questions about Ruby? Are you ready to be an ambassador for the Ruby language just for a few minutes? Sure. <laughs> okay. So most of us are familiar with C and Java, whether we love it or hate it. You know, we've probably written a little bit of PHP. I don't think I've ever written any Ruby code. Where does where does Ruby sit? What is kind of the purpose of it? Um, what, Have you written Python? What, yes. The way I think of Ruby is it's just like Python. Is it is it basically just another scripting language? What is what is Ruby's niche? What what are people trying to accomplish mainly when when they go for Ruby? I'm, I mean, I'm uh, somewhat familiar with Ruby on yeah. Rails. In the U.S., Ruby is mostly popular because of Rails. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's, I would say that that's it. Okay. And I think that, like, I mean, there are some, like, aesthetic differences between the Ruby community and the Python community and sort of how they think about programming. But I think, largely, I think of them as being the same. Um, okay. So with that little bit of background out of the way, you were using GDB to kind of drill through the Ruby interpreter. Um, what, what was the next step in trying to put this together to not have a 15-page blog post about how to debug Ruby? How, how did, did you basically re-implement GDB uh, well, for Ruby? So, Is that what happened? Well, so a little bit, yeah. Um, because you only need to implement a very small part of how GDB works, right? Um, so you have your current thread in the Ruby interpreter, which has some address. Um, mm -hmm. And so the first question is like, well, if I have the Ruby current thread variable, how do I know what its address in memory is, right? Um, and so it turns out that you can look that up in the program symbol table, um, which is actually pretty simple. Like you can use nm to look at the symbol table, or you can like use an elf parser um, on Linux. Like elf is the the format for Linux binaries, so you can just kind of like parse the binary and then figure out um, where the Ruby current thread symbol is in that binary, and then go there. Mm -hmm. uh, you also need to look at the program's memory maps to see where the Ruby binary is mapped. So you basically just need to do like a simple addition. Like you, you like find the address of the Ruby current thread variable in the program symbol table, and then you find out where it's mapped in memory, and then you add those two numbers together, and then you have your answer. Um, and then you have an address in the program's memory where you can start looking. Uh, which, I mean, I say it's simple. It took me like probably a couple of days to figure out that that was what was going on. <laughs> um, using my like existing knowledge of how binaries work on Linux, right? Um, <laughs> but like once, like when, when, once like you work through it, um, if you are not uh, already like a profiler and debugger wizard, it's not actually that hard to do. It's just like a little bit of addition. Um, and then, and then the question is like, well, okay, I have a another program, and I know about some addresses in its memory, and like, how do you read memory from it? 
like, can you read memory from another process? That sounds hard. Um, and it turns out that on Linux, there's a system called called process VM readb that just lets you read arbitrary memory from another process. So you can just say, hey, um, here's the PID, here's the address I want to read, and here's the amount of memory I want to read. And then you can just start reading memory. And it's super simple, actually. So does Ruby Spy? I, I like Ruby Spy better than RB Spy because RB Spy makes me think of uh, uh, roast beef burgers. Um, does Ruby Spy then have to run as root to be able to do this? Yes. Any workarounds um, in, for that, or is that just a hard and fast rule? No. Uh, so there are. If you started the like, if Ruby, if if it's a the parent process of the process on Linux, and it doesn't have any sure as root. So like, if it spawns the process that it's uh, reading memory of, then it doesn't need to run as root. But otherwise, it needs to run as root. Okay. And on Mac, and it you, needs to run as root always. Ah, so my next question, you keep saying on Linux. On Linux, what operating systems does Ruby Spy work on? It works on Linux and on Mac. And no Windows it support? Probably, no Windows support. It could probably be ported to Windows. I don't have a Windows machine, um, which is a <laughs> major obstacle. Um, but, and Those it could Windows also plebeians. probably be ported to BSD. Uh, but yeah, if, if, if so, someone got it, it would be pretty easy, I think. And so the, the way this works, it sounds like, is as your program runs, Ruby Spy runs along with it on probably a uh, kind of a refresh interval. And every, let's say, half a second looks in and goes, okay, which line of code or byte of the binary is it actually executing right now? And then from there, what, just builds kind of a table of I've seen it on this spot in your program this many times. And then at the yeah, end, so it, it spits out. Yeah, it collects out. the stack. Mm -hmm. It collects the stack every, usually 100 times a second, actually, is the default. Um, mm -hmm. So you can get a, a fair amount of resolution, which is nice. Um, because Ruby Spy is written in Rust, so it's a lot faster than Ruby. Um, which is important, uh, like because you, you don't want your profiler to add a lot of overhead. <laughs> um, is, right? that, like, is that the primary <laughs> reason why it's Rust instead of written in Ruby? Uh, well, the other reason is that it needs to work with a lot of C data structures. And working with C data structures is pretty easy in C and C++ and Rust and not easy in Ruby, right? Mm -hmm. um, like the Ruby interpreter is written in C. It's not written in Ruby. Um, and Ruby Spy is more like the Ruby interpreter than it is like Ruby programs. So what's the process of, of mapping going from this is where the thread is at in memory to this is the line of source code that we're uh, we're executing? How does how does that mapping work? Um, so basically, you start at the current thread, and then you go to the stack, then, and then you get the stack, um, and then you read the stack. The stack is... Um, like the Ruby stack is all located together in memory. So you basically can read the whole stack at once. You'll read like 50 stack frames. Um, and then once you have all the stack frames, those have some more pointers in them, um, which basically end up pointing to a string, uh, which is the uh, the function name and the line number. Well, so you have a string, which is the function name somewhere. And then you have another string, which is the like source, Ruby source file. And then you have another integer somewhere else, which is the line number. Um, and you just sort of go through a bunch of, uh, like, like you need to hop maybe four pointers to get there. Um, and you need to read a bunch of different C structs, um, which are exciting. So the exciting thing about the C structs that you need to look at is that they're all internal to the Ruby interpreter and they change with every Ruby version. Like their layout changes with every Ruby version. Uh, so have you talked to the Ruby guys about building some kind of API to make this uh, a, a little more elegant? Uh, not yet. Um, like I don't have an idea in some sense of like how it should work. Like I don't have a good proposal because it seems hard to say like, oh, you need to change your like internals of your interpreter to support my profiler. And like like I feel like I would want to have a better suggestion than that. <laughs> um because I, I don't feel like I have a reasonable suggestion yet. Um, this is a conversation so far, that needs to happen somewhere over a drink rather than uh, written up in a formal proposal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you'd be like, well, this doesn't make sense, but what would make sense? And I'm not sure yet. Um, but the, it's 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 a problem, right? Because you need to support different, like maybe 30 different struct layouts, um, because there are maybe 30 different Ruby versions. 
Um, like there's like 2.1, 2.1.2, 2.1.3. Um, and each of them is potentially different, right? Because they do change how the Ruby interpreter works a little bit each time. Um, and so handling that was actually one of the biggest risks of the project. So is this a one woman operation or do you have uh, anyone else working with you on this? Uh, it's basically me. Um, I, so okay. I, so we talked about nights and weekends. Um, so I initially built a prototype of this in one week. Uh, and But at that point, it didn't really work on anybody's computer except mine. And it only worked <laughs> on one Ruby version because of the aforementioned issues about how like you need to, the C structs are constantly changing, right? And I was like, I'm not sure if this is a viable project. Like, will this actually work? <laughs> I'm having flashbacks of Linus Torvald saying that uh, this will only ever work on 386 machines or, or whatever that quote was. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then it's, I felt like it would take a long time to actually build it into a real project. Um, so what I did was I applied for an open source fellowship, um, which would let me give me funding to work on it for three months, uh, oh. which I got. And then I worked on it for three months full time. And now it works. What, uh, what organization was that scholarship through? That was Segment analytics. So they're an analytics company and they decided to sponsor three open source fellowships and they awarded one to me. Um, and I thought that was really cool because it was like, this is, this was a, I think this is like a really cool thing for the Ruby community. Um, but I definitely wouldn't have had time to build it in my nights and weekends um, because it was a pretty big project. And so it wouldn't have happened if they hadn't funded it. Right. So, what were the dark ages of Ruby like? How would someone have tried to solve this problem before Ruby Spy came along? Uh, with GDB. Um, and G like Ruby comes with a, like a GDB init file, which has a bunch of different like GDB macros, which can help you navigate the internals of the Ruby interpreter for your program. Um, so it's not that bad. Um, and you, you could also use a profiler where you change your source code. There's this very good profiler for Ruby called Stackprof. Um, which is a sampling profiler. And you just include the gem in your program. A gem is a Ruby library. You include the library in your program. Um, and it has a pretty simple interface and you can set it up. Um, you just have to have done it in advance. So you have to have had the foresight. <laughs> <laughs> so what's a, what's a flame graph? I see this on one of the documentation pages. Right. Um, so uh, one... So how do you usually, like if you're profiling a program, what statistics do you usually get? Uh, I guess percentage of times and number of times each uh, subroutine was invoked. Yeah. Um, so the issue with that, that's great, obviously, right? Um, mm. You can say like, oh, we spent 80% of our time in the subroutine. Um, but the problem is that you kind of... And, and so you can do better than that. And you can say, okay, you can also have like sort of the self time and the total time for each subroutine, which is like uh, the total time is like how much time did we spend in this uh, in this function and in every function it called. Um, or you could say, here's how much time I spent just in this function, like sort of excluding everything it made a call to. Um, mm -hmm. But that's, it, it can be hard to figure out like, sort of like what the overall shape of execution of your program is. Um, so what a flame graph is, is, is it's, it basically like, it takes every stack trace that was sampled and it sorts them and then it puts them into this like kind of, I don't know, we, I mean, it's hard to show without a picture. We would need a picture. Um, but it basically puts them in a way where it makes it really easy to see like where, like how all the stack traces fit together um, so that, and it makes it makes it easier to figure out like what, like what functions the most time are being spent on. It's basically like a richer visualization than this sort of like self time, total time summary. Um, yeah, it's, it's and, it use, using profiling data is always a matter of trying to understand, you know, if I, if, how much time am I spending in this actual subroutine versus how much time is it calling out to? Because if you spend a lot of time optimizing something that's called frequently and has spent a lot of time overall in your process, but most of that was you know, outbound calls, it doesn't make sense to optimize that subroutine. It makes sense to optimize the things it's calling. So you need that sort of data when you're taking profiling data. Um, what else is profiling data used for besides just making the program run faster? Is there anything, anything else it's used for? I don't think so. Um, I can't <laughs> okay. think of anything. I mean, why? I don't know. Yeah. I, like, I can it, actually it, jump it, in. I, I know uh, of another uh, use that, at least in C code, is pretty important. We use some of the profiling tools when we're doing code coverage tests. And so if you have a, a test suite, you also run the profiler 
and then you can have it spit out at the end of the day. This percentage of the lines of code got exercised while we were running these tests. So it's kind of an odd usage in some ways, but a really important usage of, uh, of profiling, at least under C. So this is really interesting because my coworker just asked me about this the other day. He was like, could we use the profiler for code coverage? And I felt kind of unsure because like, especially with a statistical profiler, it'll tell you some things that were uh, like some things that ran, but it won't tell you everything that ran. Right. And so I'm curious about how you think about that. So, um, it, um, so you mentioned a moment ago, stack prof, I think. Uh, so was that, did that already exist and not fulfill your needs so that you wanted to create a different profiler? Yeah, just because you need to edit your program to use stack prof. And I wanted, I felt like I had a right to know what all of my programs were doing, no matter what. And let me um, clarify something you said earlier, because I was a little confused by that. You said you need to be root to run this. On, but there was some other condition. Isn't it just that you need to be able, you, you're the same owner as, as the process? Uh, yeah, so if you started the process, like, or if your process is like a parent of the process, or if you're the yeah. same owner, then, uh, but I think you actually, you have to have spawned the process. Like, I don't think that it works. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it doesn't work if just like, if you're, if you're, if you're the same user. Oh, that's interesting. Um, okay, cool. Yeah. It's the same as P-Trace. Yeah. And we have the a picture for the flame graphs now. So John, you want to bring that up? Yeah. I'd scroll down to one of those colorful things down below there. So yeah, there, so there's a. If you're watching the video, you can see okay. one of these flame graphs. And yeah, what, what so are we looking really at here? Okay, so this is a very simple flame graph. Um, the, so the idea is that your main function is at the top here, and then all the functions you call are at the bottom. Um, ah. So you see there's this function called B on the left. Um, okay. So the idea is like 50% of your time was spent in the B function, right? Because that takes up sort of like 50% of the graph. Um, mm -hmm. And then B called C and D. And then you can see 50% of your time was also spent in C, right? So you can sort of see like immediately that like no time is actually being spent in B itself. It just calls C and then all of this time is spent in C. Um, and then D and then C calls D and then like, like half of the time that it's spent in D is also spent in D. Cool. Does that make all sense? right. Well, that that's, that's cool. Yeah, that's right. It is a lot more visual than just staring at numbers going 72% and 38% and stuff like that. Yeah. So, and you can kind of just like look for like the big parts of the graph and be like, Oh, yeah. this is, that's the important part. And then ignore yes. the other stuff. Yes. So how did you get from only having it working on your version to having it work on, uh, was it all modern versions of Ruby? Yeah. Um, so, uh, so originally I started out by using a dwarf. Um, do you know about dwarf debugging no. info? Cool. No. Um, so the way that if you go into GDB and you start debugging a C program and you ask it to print out, uh, let's say, uh, a struct, or you try to like access the member of a struct um, in C. Uh, this basically, like, it's like it's like how could this work, right? Because GDB is reading memory from your program, uh, mm -hmm. from from a program, and then each like a C struct has members, and they have they, they they're like at some offset, right? Like maybe the first one is at like eight bytes, and maybe like sixteen bytes, thirty two bytes um, from the beginning of the struct, um, mm -hmm. but. Like there's no metadata by default in a C program, which tells you like where each struct member is, right? It's just binary. Right. Um, and so what Dwarf is, is it's a format for storing debug debugging info, which basically tells you like the offsets of every member in every struct in your C program. Um, and uh, so, so if you install like a uh, package dash dbg uh, uh, packages on Debian. That's what those are. Like they're they're usually like debugging info won't be shipped with packages on Debian. It ships separately um, because usually it takes up extra space, so you don't necessarily want it on your hard drive if you're not debugging the program. Um, and so, um, yeah, so it's this extra information that you can use to figure out like what's going on with the C program, uh, which is great. Um, and so I started out by using that, uh, but I didn't really like that approach because. Not everyone has debug info installed, right? And it kind of sucks to sell, tell someone that, like, this doesn't work because of something that isn't installed that you didn't know existed. Right. <laughs> right. Like, it's like, oh, you need, like, dwarf debugging info. And they're like, what's that? Right. Like, um, that kind of, yeah, it just, like, felt like a bad experience. And the whole reason I wanted to do this was to make it easier to use. Um, so uh, what I what I did was there is a second way to know how a C struct is laid out. Um 
which is uh, by looking at its header file, right? Like if you sure. have the source code for a C-struct, um, then you then you know how it's laid out, right? Because like given the definition of a C-struct, it's always going to be like the compiler will always uh, lay it out in the same way. Um, because if it didn't, then linking wouldn't work. Like dynamic linking wouldn't work, and that mm -hmm. would be bad, right? Dynamic linking is very important. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, so, so basically, what what I realized was I was like, well, I have the Ruby interpreter source code, right? Like I can get clone it, um, and I in particular have the source code for every Ruby version, right? Because I can just like check out the Git tag for every version of it, um, and so I can get the uh, all the structs that are inside it. And so, and then I can just like compile them the right way and then mm -hmm. use those offsets. Um, and I, so, but it's like, how do you do that in practice, right? Cause like managing, like I needed to deal with probably like maybe like 50 different C structs. Uh, yeah. And then I needed to like have different versions of those potentially for every Ruby version. So, which of, of which there were like 40. Um, so it might seem like intractable to do this. <laughs> um, yes. uh, like it doesn't sound fun uh, but it turned out to be super easy uh, so what I did was uh, Rust uh, which is the programming language I used has this program called BindGen which lets you really easily generate like Rust source code um, from c -structs. so I just like cool. took the c -structs I was interested in and then I generated Rust code to deal with all of them um, basically like the equivalent Rust structs and then I made those all like I made one file for every Ruby version just like Ruby 2.3.1 Ruby 2.3.2 .rs um, and then I used macros to compile a different version of the functions I wanted uh, to for every Ruby version hmm. so I only need to write my code once and then it, the compiler would just compile it uh, for every Ruby version I was interested in um, so, so it, it turned out to be only like maybe 600 a thousand lines of code uh, to handle every Ruby version. Um, so so d does one binary handle all the different Ruby versions, or do you have to get the right binary for your particular flavor of Ruby? One binary handles all of them. Um, wow. So I, like, I compile 40 different like versions of the function inside my binary, and then at runtime, I just dispatch the right one. Like I just check the Ruby version. I'm like, okay, run the Ruby 2.4.1 function. Um, but of course, that's totally transparent to the user, right? They don't know that all this weird stuff is happening. And, and so there's some way that the program, as it's starting up, can uh, talk to the binary and uh, talk to the Ruby binary and figure out which version it is, right? Yeah, yeah. There's the Ruby version symbol that it can just look up. Oh, that's simple then. Um, uh, we do have a, then, we have a question from the chat room, which is uh, Micro is asking himself, and this is really relevant to what we're just saying now. Is uh, the new version of Ruby will be JIT compiled? Will our Ruby spy need to be changed much to accommodate the new version? I have no plan yet. <laughs> if you have, and I haven't looked at the implementation of the JIT that much, and I don't know. Um, so if if anyone is excited about talking about that with me, we should figure it out. <laughs> but it's See, a serious problem, and I don't know yet. So, so you're, you're saying help already, huh? It's like ah, yeah. Well, no. I mean, I, I just look at the implementation. Maybe it won't be that bad. Um, but I but I haven't. I noticed in the bio you sent me, you said you've been writing about debuggers and profilers. Are you more of a technical writer than a programmer, or are you a little bit of both? Um, so I'm definitely mostly a programmer. Um, okay. I do, I have a blog on the side, I think, like many programmers. Um, and so I don't program very much in my spare time. Uh, what I do in my spare time is I write about things that I am learning about. Cool. Um, and so uh, four years ago, uh, I think I think where this all started is four years ago, someone told me about S-Trace. Um, do you all know about S-Trace? Yes. Um, so S-Trace, as you know, um, lets you trace system calls and it lets you see what system calls your programs are running, right? And when I learned about this, I thought this was amazing and like extremely magical um, because I'd been programming. I think at the time that I learned about it, I'd been programming for maybe 10 years and I never heard of it. Um, so I was like, I can just know what files my programs are opening. This is outrageous and amazing. Why did nobody tell me? And so I felt very uh, kind of upset that no one had told me before. So I decided that I was going to tell everybody about S-Trace. Um, and so I wrote a lot about S-Trace. I wrote about a lot about other uh, profiling and debugging tools called like, like Perf um, or um, like networking tools like TCP dump or netstat or like ngrep 
because I think networking is like one of the really interesting places where you can figure out what your programs are doing. Um, yeah. I think one of the things I'm currently best known for is writing uh, educational comics and zines about these tools so on my website um i have these like 24 page hand-drawn uh like booklets being like spying how to spy on your program with s-trace or like here's how to use perf um and and, cool. and, I, and I do this because yeah um I, I i do this because i think a lot of these tools like s-trace or like perf which is this like linux kernel tool which is like in documented i think in a pretty inaccessible way um People don't know about them, and they're actually not that hard to use. I think a lot of the time, um, and if like if we just explain them to people in a way where it's easy to understand, then you kind of like have these amazing superpowers, right? Um, and so I've spent a lot of time doing that. But in this case, I was like, there's no tool for me to document that's amazing and that people can use. So I need to write my own, right? And I need to actually create something new. Nice, and we will have the link to that uh, the, your zines page uh, on the show notes, so people can uh, look the notes for this show when they uh, want to go find that. I'm, Highly recommend that based on your description of it. And I'm probably doing that a little bit afterwards, distracting me from other things I'm supposed to be getting done today, but that's okay. That's the way it works all the time when I'm doing this show. I always find something fun to go do afterwards, and so I end up taking up a the rest of my Wednesday usually, which is uh, very sad. Anyway, um, uh, just uh, you mentioned S-Trace. Uh, have you had much time to play with D-Trace? No, because I use Linux. I um, thought it runs on Linux. Maybe it doesn't. Me, I think maybe it does, but no. Okay. Um, like maybe yeah. very recently it does, but it yeah, right now it doesn't. Well, it started, I think, in Solaris and then got ported a bunch of places, including the Mac. So you have it on your Mac for sure. Right. Um, yeah. Yes. So that's uh, and what I like about it is you can construct these arbitrarily complex expressions that are being run essentially in kernel space to decide whether to log an event or not. And it's a very, very clever uh, uh, setup. And and things like Perl have been uh, augmented with D-Trace calls. So you can say when Perl gets to this subroutine, I think Ruby has D-Trace hooks as well. So it's something to kind of get a much bigger picture of how everything's actually all working. So you might want to look into that. But uh, I'm definitely going to check out your magazines. It sounds good. So, uh, so again, you don't spend much of your time programming. You sound a lot like me in that I actually spend more of my time talking about things and writing about things than about programming these days, although I'm sort of picking that back up again when I'm uh, yeah. learning Flutter. Learning Flutter well, so I guess I, I feel like I program more. at work all the time, and so like then going home to program, like I don't have enough space in my brain to then program outside of work. <laughs> Well, it's like people used to ask me, you know, like when I was teaching classes uh, two or three weeks a month, uh, first off, that's the maximum I can teach on the road without going totally crazy. But they'd always ask me why, what happens if you, uh, I mean, do you get out to see the city after work? And I go, no, I've spent the full day standing up in front of 20 people, you know, uh, looking at their programs, looking at their labs. Uh, I am exhausted at the end of the day. I can barely, uh, you know, make my way to a karaoke bar, and that's about all the time I have. So I've been to hundreds of cities that I haven't seen anything more than my hotel and the workplace. So um, uh, that's a, a sad a little bit, that, but I guess that's the way it works sometimes. Yeah, Julia, yeah. your your <laughs> comics, your zines. I've seen those on Twitter several times and had no idea that was you. Those are actually excellent. <laughs> uh, I really enjoy those. Thank you. Um, so I, I would like to ask, what uh, what language is uh, Ruby Spy writ or excuse me, license? What <laughs> uh, little brain bug I might need to debug there. Um, what license is Ruby Spy under? It's MIT licensed. Okay, and uh, what what was your uh, what was your reason for going with MIT? Uh, was the first thing that came to mind. <laughs> the, the first, <laughs> the think first maybe, open source maybe, compatible maybe was... license. <laughs> um, um, I think I think maybe I picked it because a lot of Rust projects use the MIT license. Mm -hmm. yeah. it seemed reasonable. Sure. Um, so you you got the uh, you got the three month scholarship. Do you have any further plans to try to uh, make a career or make money out of Ruby Spy? It's an interesting. I mean, right now I have a job, I guess, which makes it hard, um, mm -hmm. and I don't work on profiling at my job. Uh, but, uh, like, I, I think that there is an interesting business opportunity there, right? Um, because people are using dynamic languages, uh, in, uh, in a lot of places and they're scaling with dynamic languages, right? So they have these like very compl complex applications, which are written in languages like Python and like Ruby and like PHP. 
Um, and sometimes those programs are slow and it's not, I think it's not realistic most of the time to say like, Oh, just like rewrite it in Java or like in C or whatever in something faster. Um, like people, it's, I think much more reasonable to stick with your existing language. Um, and I think our tools, the, the tools that these language ha- just have for figuring out why they're slow are not very good right now. Um, they're hard to use. Uh, they're, I think often not that powerful or they're much less powerful than the like C and Java equivalents, um, because people have invested so much in like the Java profiling ecosystem. Um, so the, I think that there is like a lot of opportunity to do something exciting, but I don't currently have any plans to do that. Sadly, for too many people, the solution for slow uh, interpreted code is to wait for Moore's law to fix it, <laughs> which is terrible. I don't, know, I, don't know that, I don't know if that's true at this point, right? Like, I think that computers are not getting faster in some sense. Like, like, like if you want your program to run faster on a single computer, I think you actually have to make it faster. <laughs> um, or, 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 or you can parallelize it, like, and you can run it on many computers. So that comes with a lot of complications, too. Mm-hmm. Do you have any idea how many people are currently using Ruby Spy? Uh, that's a good question. I've gotten, I think, like ten, five, like five to ten testimonials from people who have been like, "Hello, I use this at work, and now my programs are faster, and my boss thinks I'm amazing," um, which was like very <laughs> heartwarming because that was what I wanted. Like, I want people to feel like they are amazing, and like they have the power to make, make their programs faster, um, and I want their boss to think that, think that they're amazing. Um, See, what you need to do when you get one of those testimonials is write them back and ask for a maintenance contract. That's how you make money with these things. (laughs) (laughs) Perhaps. Uh, So I saw that you're using GitHub. Um, GitHub has been in the news recently. I'm kind of going a little different direction to warn you. Do you have any concerns with continuing to use GitHub? No. I think... (laughs) We'll see how things go. I don't know. I haven't been thinking about it. That seems to be most everyone's attitude. But when I saw that your your website and your code was hosted on GitHub, I, I just I had to throw it in there and ask. <laughs> so uh, you only have uh, you said about ten or so testimonials you've gotten back. Um, uh, do you have any situations where someone is using Ruby Spy for something that you never anticipated? Any any weird or wacky use cases? Um, one person was using it to, pro- like, I, I was imagining that people would mostly be using it to profile, profile things that were pretty slow, like that maybe took like seconds, um, or minutes to run. Um, but someone, one person was actually writing a Ruby, like a sort of Ruby extension, um, like a Ruby agent thing that they needed to be really fast. Um, so they were like, oh, my thing will actually only runs in like 10 milliseconds. Um, but I want to see if there are opportunities to make it faster. Um, and because like I can only really sample like a hundred times a second, um, it was sort of an issue for them. And they ended up having to say like, okay, I'm just going to run my thing like 2000 times and then use RB spy on it that way. Um, which worked fine. Um, but I, I, I was surprised that people were interested in running it more than a hundred times a second. Um, like in having it sample more than a hundred times a second. That's well, that's very similar to the idea of trying to do code coverage with it. Uh, that that would be one of the solutions for that problem is run it a whole bunch of times and then you know your statistics would eventually uh, kind of flatten out to where you get a decent idea of which uh, which code paths are hit. Yeah, um, I feel like there's an is, opportunity to do like maybe fast tracing of mm-hmm. uh, like because tracing profilers are usually very slow, um, but I feel like there's there might be a way to make tra- a tracing profiler fast and that could be really useful. So by that you mean do it more than your what hundred times a second, run it run it more often than that. Um, no, I mean like actually trace every function call, but figure out how to make that fast instead of slow. Ah, uh, uh, so so force it to to in one way or another hook into and call Ruby Spy every time it essentially moves from one line of code to the next. Yeah, I mean it would probably have to be a completely different program, which was designed in a totally different way. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not like it's probably not going to happen. Um, so, sounds like it's time for that that drink to talk to the Ruby guys about getting an API to help you do this stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so would you say that Ruby Spy is ready for production? Are you are you ready to put that sign up at the top of your uh, GitHub page? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I think the kind of exciting thing about the way that it's designed is that it doesn't it it only reads from your program. Right. 
Um, so it doesn't change. It doesn't. And uh, unlike some other profilers that, that use Ptrace, it doesn't uh, stop your program at all. So like it doesn't. It basically doesn't interfere with what your program is doing. So even if it's buggy, it's not going to affect your production system, right? Um, which 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 was a, a design goal of mine because I do not have unlimited confidence in my ability to write software with no bugs. <laughs> um, so I was just like, I'll design this so that it cannot break people's production code. Um, and so that it's impossible. And then if our VSI crashes, it's no big deal, right? Like it's obviously not ideal, but, um, it's about getting information. And th so the worst thing that can happen is that you don't get the information you need or that you want it. I think it's a sign of wisdom to design your project with the idea that I'm going to have bugs in this. Let's make it as least disastrous as possible. I think more people need to get on that bandwagon. Yeah. Um, so in, in Ruby, is there, again, I'm, I'm not a Ruby programmer at all. Is there the concept of forking and does Ruby spy handle that gracefully? Can it follow both children of a fork? So it can follow the children of a fork right now. Oh, can it? No, I think right now, oh, what does it do? Okay, no, there's a feature for this. How does it work? <laughs> um, so you can definitely uh, follow all the subprocesses of a process. Like you can, get, you can give it a PID and be like, look at all the subprocesses of this process. Um, and I don't remember right now if it refreshes that periodically, but it should, like if it doesn't, I can make that. I can make it do that easily. Um. <laughs> so Rick, Rick in our chat room says it uh, it does have to pause the program briefly to read from the running program. So uh, it, it probably doesn't stop for very long, but it certainly doesn't have to um, pause it for a really long time. Apparently, it doesn't pause the program. Huh. Okay. Well, Rick is wrong then. <laughs> I would believe um, you. So oh, it, or actually, it's it, it's sort of a it's sort of a problem in some sense, right? Because process VM doesn't stop the program, and it means it doesn't give you a consistent view of the program's memory. Mm -hmm. Um. So, like that could mean that like the memory could be changed while process VM, like while RBSpy is reading the program's memory. Um, okay. And it it could mean that you get incorrect information. And uh, Eric Duckman also said in the chat room, uh, in October of 2011, I think he's quoting from Wikipedia here, uh, Oracle announced the porting of Dtrace to Linux, but for several years, only an unofficial Dtrace port to Linux was available with no changes in licensing terms. So you probably still could probably play with Dtrace on uh, on Linux. That's probably that port that's still out there. They just so. changed the license oh, to make it well. compatible with Linux pretty recently. Oh, nice. Okay, well, that's good. So Dtrace is, uh, is, is out there. That's great. You can play with that then. Uh, we're almost out of time. Um, uh, one of the things uh, that uh, you mentioned to me uh, previous uh, to, prior to the show was that uh, Ruby Spy has really great documentation, and did you put a lot of extra effort into its usability? Yeah. Um, that, so um, I guess like the thing I said at the beginning was that like every profiling tool is different, and mm -hmm. it makes it really difficult for people who almost never use profiling tools, which is almost everyone, to use, right? Um, so like one thing, one, one small thing that I did um, was there's this flame graph support, right? Um, right? And most profiling tools kind of like give you the, like they might give you some output that you can use to make a flame graph, but they don't always make it easy to make the flame graph or they don't always do it by default. Uh, and in fact, they usually don't do it by default. Um, and so, but if you like don't know that flame graphs exist, it's very hard to like go figure out what you need to do to make a flame graph uh, because you don't know it exists. Um, so what I right. decided to do with RBSpy was um, there's this Perl script uh, that Brendan Gregg wrote who invented flame graphs um, uh, that can generate flame graphs from like a pretty simple like text input format, uh, which like anybody could write, and it generates an SVG. Um, and so I checked the license on this Perl script in this Git repo, and I was like, oh, I, this license is such that I could just include this Perl script in my program, like just like compile it into my binary as a string. Um, uh, so uh, instead of people having to like go get the Perl script and generate the flame graph, it just automatically works. Right, and then our B slide just generates flame graphs by default. And what people have said is, they're like, "Oh, this is so useful," and I didn't realize that this, like, that this tool existed. Right, and, and I wouldn't have thought to go look for it. But now that I know it exists, of course, I'm going to use it all the time. Um, and so I think that there's something really important about just like making things work by default. And it can often be very easy. Like maybe it's as easy as just like compiling a Perl script into your binary. <laughs> So, so wait, so you compiled a Perl script in your binary? Does that mean there's the entire Perl interpreter in your binary as well? No, just the, just the, just the script. Um, I assume no. that people have Perl in their system, which they generally do. <laughs> 
Oh, oh, okay. So you're you're calling out to a Perl program or calling out yeah, to a Perl interpreter yeah. somewhere. I, I just like have ah. like the source code for the Perl script inside my binary. Okay, okay. I was, I was getting a little worried there that you had like this giant Rust program, and over in the corner here, taking up three quarters of it is, is the Perl interpreter. <laughs> just that, to be able to that run would this be script. exciting, but but no. <laughs> so what's on the roadmap? What what are you still missing besides the new version that talks to the jitter? Uh, what what, what are, you, are you missing anything else of of substance right now? Um, I don't think that there's anything really big. Uh, what am I missing? I think like one thing that I would love to do is to make a heap profiler, which helps you figure out like where your remit profiler's memory is being mm-hmm. used, right? Um, which I think, which is a big problem for a lot of Ruby programs because people will be like, "Oh, my program is using three three gigabytes of memory. Why?" <laughs> um, yeah. And it's it's difficult to figure out. Um, so I would love to build a tool to do that um, if I had unlimited time. <laughs> ah, yes. None of us have unlimited time, and some of us less than others. So yes, I can definitely uh, uh, appreciate that. Um, I did see in the little video on the main page that it was dumping out some data. What what format is it dumping it out in, and what tools understand that format? So right now, it dumps a custom uh, format. Uh, so basically, uh, the way you work with RBSpy is you can do RBSpy record, um, which will sort of collect data and then save it. And it's like it's basically just like gzip JSON. Um, it's a very simple okay. format. Um, yeah. And then if you do RBSpy report, it can generate uh, a few different kinds of reports. So it can either generate a summary, which is like the self time and the total time. It can generate a flame graph. It can generate a call grind format, which you can u- mm. use with uh, like K cache grind um, or any any of these like cache grind visualization tools. Um, and if anyone has ideas for other formats in the future, we could generate those too. Um, yeah, but like having, I think, I think like there aren't really good custom, like, like standards for profiling data. I think like there's the GProf, like, like, so, like so a lot of the, like Go, Go has this protobuf format, um, but I don't. I don't think it's really that. I don't know how widely used it is outside of, uh, outside of Go. So. So of course, if I somebody just, wants to add something, they can always, you know, uh, fork your project on GitHub and add it, and then send you a pull request, right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Like if someone had an idea for another thing that like RB Spy Report should generate, I would be delighted to accept that. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, we're almost out of time. Is there anything we didn't ask that you wanted to make sure we cover before we have to let you go? Um. No, I have a question for you, um, which okay. is: Do you think that Perl should have a sampling profiler, or that it does, uh, or like, do you think I'm, that this kind of tool, which like magically tells you what your Perl program is doing, should exist for Perl, or does it exist? I I believe NYTProf has that mode, so um, uh, I think NYTProf operates both in the mode of actually intercepting the the calls by using low level debugger calls in, inside Perl. But I think it also has the mode where it's just simply sampling. So or if not, I'm pretty sure there is already another uh, sampling profiler in the Perl world. I just uh, don't, can't think of it at the moment. Do you need to start your program with NYT prof or can you? Uh, you can add it on the command line. So it's just simply saying uh, Perl dash uh, M NYT prof uh, okay. and the rest of the command line. Um, but so if your Perl program it, is already r- running yeah, yeah, I think that that's not an option for it. Uh, I may be wrong, though. It may be that uh, that it, it all works that way. It's been a while since I've done any profiling. Uh, when ZipRecruiter hired me uh, four years ago, I used it a ton when I was trying to figure out why this crazy, giant, monolithic, five years into making a uh, Perl application was running slow. So um, they, that's why they brought me in, to make that go faster. And then after I spent <laughs> six months making it go faster, it was so fast that it was like, well, now what do we do with Randall? So I've been <laughs> doing all sorts of weird things for ZipRecruiter over the last four years. But yeah, so I used NYP Prof heavily, but it was that was about four years ago. So I forget now what's going on with it. So uh, anything else that we need to cover? No. Cool. It's well, Julie, great. it's been a wonderful having you on. I think... You set the record for the guest asking the hosts the most questions out of every show I've done over the last 10 years. I appreciate that, though. That's fine. That's totally fine. It was fun. I loved answering things, too, because I do like talking about myself because I'm a human. So uh, (laughs) thanks a lot for coming on the show. And uh, and, uh, I'm sure if you're in the Ruby community, this is definitely going to be something that you'll want to be reaching for. and, uh, uh, and, And thank you for having produced it. Thank you so much for having me. Great. That was Julie Evans talking to us 
about Ruby Spy, which she called RV Spy a couple times. I don't know if she's going to go back on that, but I like Ruby Spy. It's, 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 a, it's a great name, Jonathan. So uh, what do you think, Jonathan? Uh, for someone doing work with Ruby, I think it is a excellent little program, um, especially, you know, as we talked about, once you get to the point building a program that you're ready to start doing profiling, it sounds like absolutely the uh, the right tool to reach for. Um, I do think the idea of having an API to be able to talk to the Ruby interpreter uh, is the logical next step to be able to make it do bigger and better things, uh, particularly being able to do things like code coverage, uh, which is a you know super important when you're when you're trying to get when you're trying to go from uh, a program that works to a program that you can start to say yeah it's it's kind of bulletproof and we can put it out there in front of the world. Uh, being able to do code tests and code coverage is is super important. And it sounds like she's really close. Well, if you're willing to to run your your test suite a thousand times and get statistics off of it, you can you can use it now. Um, but it, it it sounds like it's a it's a really neat tool, and I think it's also super interesting that it's just it was an itch that she had and she decided to scratch. And you know, sounds like over the course of a few days, started figuring out okay, here's here's the different things I can do to actually make this work. A really neat story and, and looks like a very neat tool. Yeah, uh, and I'm, I'm happy to have uh, clarified that she isn't putting an entire Perl interpreter in her binary. That was <laughs> was going to be scary. So, well, I just copied the Perl source code right there into my binary. And I went, uh, hmm, that means you need an <laughs> interpreter somewhere. Mm, anyway, so uh, I don't know much about Rust. Uh, we have, did we have a show on Rust already? I think we did. We did? Yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, I have to Google now. I can never remember. I remember talking to somebody about doing a show on Rust. Oh, yeah, so yeah, so sometime, sometime, I think about three months ago, we had a show on Rust, so I should have looked that up ahead of time so I could tell you what show number it is, but uh, Google will find it, I'm sure, Floss Weekly Rust, and it shouldn't be the discoloring around the edges of our screen, but no. Anyway, so that's that. Um, so yeah, uh, profilers, very important. Um, they absolutely need to be in your toolkit. Um, that's why I'm very happy with NYT Prof um, with Perl because it's just so detailed. It's like there's about six or seven different levels that you can drill down to. Like um, every statement, you can get a, a reading for every time a statement is executed and what percentage of the time it's spending there. Because when you drill down to that level, you're really slowing your app down. So it's uh, cause it's got to make all, write all that extra information out there. So that was cool. So I'm glad uh, I'm glad uh, Julia got to come on and talk about this. And um, I'm sure if you're in the Ruby environment, uh, this is going to be a good thing for you. Oh wait, wait! Uh, before we before I hand it off to uh, Jonathan for a second, um, um, uh, uh, Eric Duckman in the chat room. Thank you. Uh, March twenty eighth, uh, so the, this year uh, was uh, show number four seventy seven was on Rust. So if you want to go look that up and play it back, so find out more about the Rust language because that is a really interesting language. It's, it makes uh, immutable data structures so that uh, uh, you can't have locks and things like that. You know, so you make code that runs really really fast. Anyway, so let's see what's coming up here. We got Key Cloak next week, which oh no. We don't have anything next week. I should, forgot to start with that. Uh, I'm taking a break. Uh, I'm going to be uh, on site at a new location at ZipRecruiter. Uh, we're moving to a new building, and there's an all-day, um, all-hands conference during the entire day, so I have to find two guest hosts. And so we are canceling next week's show. Won't be blowing up, but two weeks from now, we'll be back with KeyCloak, which is open source identity and access management for modern applications and services. Following that will be the Pillar Project, which is, we are building the world's best cryptocurrency and token wallet that will become the dashboard for your digital life. Uh, that's some big claims. We'll see how they do that. Friendica is decentralized architecture with no central authority or ownership, and relationships can be made across any compatible system, creating a network of internet scale made up of smaller sites. That sounds like fun. Just added to the schedule between last week and this week, Free Code Camp, which is where you learn to code for free, and you can donate your coding skills to nonprofits. So a little bit different kind of show, because we normally do shows that are about some project, but this is about sort of, well, meta project, which is a project about projects. That'll be fun. Uh, nothing else on the immediate schedule. I have a couple people looking at dates though uh again if you have uh, if you go to the homepage for this show twitch.tv slash floss you'll see the link to what we call the big spreadsheet there because it's really a google spreadsheet and if you have any other suggestions please tell the project leader or the community coordinator to email me merlin at stonehenge.com you don't have to remember that because that's on the homepage. Uh, again there's no show 
Oh, yes. You can follow us at Floss Weekly on Google Plus and at Floss Weekly on Twitter. You can follow me at Randall L. Schwartz on Google, Google Plus and at Merlin on Twitter. So, again, as I said, no show next week. We also are taking the 4th of July off. It turns out that uh, a U.S. holiday falls on a Wednesday this year, so we are taking that. Uh, the whole studio is going to be closed for those. I will be in two weeks at the Pearl Conference in Salt Lake City. If you see me there, please come up and say hi. I will then be in Norway on a cruise in July up to the north of the Arctic Circle. So that means I'm actually going to get to see, since it's in July, I'm going to get to see a 24-hour day, and I'm really looking forward to that. It's been on my bucket list for decades now, and I'll finally get to do that. Also, some friends of mine, or fans of the show, in Bergen are trying to set up a lunch for me, so that'll be cool. So I'll be able to get off the ship and go meet up with some of y'all that are listening to this very voice at this moment. So that's pretty cool. So anything you want to plug there, Jonathan? I'll mention that you can follow me on Twitter at JP underscore Bennett. Uh, I, I may have found my niche on Twitter, and that is looking at the crazy things politicians say about technology and face palming and explaining how it actually works. Uh, the big kerfluffle with, uh, let's see, the Republican Party out in California got tagged as Nazi. Of course, everyone mm -hmm. was saying, it's Google, they're biased. It's like, no, guys, this is this is Wikipedia vandalism, which is a problem, but it's not the problem you think it is. So that's the kind of thing you find on my Twitter feed these days. Cool, cool. Well, um, <laughs> thanks once again for stepping in at the last minute. Well, not really last minute, just sometime between last week and this week. You said yes, so here you are. And I appreciate <laughs> your insights, your, your, uh, your comments and everything. I really appreciate that. So thank you for being on the show. My pleasure. All righty, and that was another show in the can. We'll see you all again next week on Floss Weekly.